I'm very pleased to be here uh, this afternoon to have the opportunity to talk about European sports law. Um, my title is Keeping the Judges Out, Three Strategies for Defending Sporting Autonomy. And I think it follows the sorts of themes that Ben has already introduced in his opening remarks. The quote that I've used to kick things off is from The Guardian two years ago. Giles Clark, the chairman of the England and Wales Cricket Board, has revealed that the governing body has closed down 700 pirate websites providing illegal streams of matches and warned that they're the biggest danger facing the game. You may, of course, rethink now that just a couple of weeks ago England were defeated by the Netherlands at cricket. <laughs> but at least two years ago, it was pirate websites that were the biggest danger facing the game. Of, of course, it's nonsense. It's April in England. The sun is shining, the grass is green, and people are out in white clothes playing cricket. Pirate websites don't worry people playing cricket on village greens all round the shires and counties of England. What Giles Clark really means is that pirate websites are the biggest danger facing the commercial underpinnings of the professional game of cricket. He's concerned with protecting revenues. Professional sport has become very big business. And the rise of the financial implications of sport, professional sport, brings with it the rise of law, the rise of litigation. And that's the context in which we have to understand the pleas for autonomy that we frequently hear from sports governing bodies. There may be some good reasons for protecting the lex sportiva from the application of the ordinary law of states or of the European Union. We might accept that international sporting bodies need an unfragmented global regime which isn't broken apart by local territorially specific laws. The Lex Sportiva does have normative claims to autonomy. But at the same time, let's remember that frequently sporting bodies claim autonomy so as to protect their commercial interests from the control that would be normal in other industries. What I'm talking about this afternoon are three particular ways in which sports bodies seek to protect their autonomy. What I call the contractual, the legislative, and the interpretative. The contractual being the submission of sporting disputes to arbitration to keep them out of the ordinary courts. The legislative being the extraction of legislative immunities for sporting activities. And the interpretative being submissions before ordinary courts that sport is special and it should be given partial or total immunity from the application of the rules to which car makers, shipbuilders, sausage makers would be subject. First then, the contractual solution. If we look to the FIFA statute, specifically Article 68, we see that there is a high profile given the CAS, the Court of Arbitration for Sport. It is provided that disputes will be handled in-house, in effect, by FIFA, and appeals will go to CAS, which calls itself a court but is really an arbitral tribunal. What's more, the FIFA statutes provide for exclusivity. Disputes shall not be brought before the ordinary courts, and national associations are required to implement that prohibition against recourse to the ordinary courts within their jurisdiction. And sanctions may be imposed too on parties that disregard that uh, submission to arbitration and instead go before the ordinary courts. You'll find similar schemes in the constitutions of other sports governing bodies such as the International Olympic Committee. The sporting disputes are subject to arbitration, the contractual process whereby there is an agreement to keep out of the ordinary court. As a matter of law, that means that CAS awards can be overturned only by the Swiss Federal Tribunal under the Swiss Federal Act on Private International Law. Very rarely 
our CAS awards overturned on the basis that arbitral awards should, in general, be respected and treated as final. Recently, in the Methuselah case, a CAS award was overturned. Exceptionally, this was the case of a Brazilian who had been transferred from a Ukrainian club to a Spanish club um, and had terminated that contract without just cause and was therefore subject to the payment of a compensation award, which wasn't paid, leading to a second set of sanctions against the player suspending him from playing, both awards being upheld by CAS. The Swiss Tribunal held that the second award, the suspension from playing, could not be upheld because it was such a serious intrusion into his personal liberty. So CAS awards may be opened up before the Swiss courts, but it's very rare. It's exceptional. The norm is that what CAS decides holds, even when CAS gets the law wrong. What that also means is that CAS awards are then enforceable throughout the world as Swiss arbitral awards pursuant to the provisions of the New York Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards, to which the United States and all the member states of the European Union are party. And it provides, as I mentioned on the framework handout, that each contracting state shall recognize arbitral awards as binding and enforce them in accordance with the rules of procedure of the territory where the award is relied upon on the conditions laid down in the following articles. So the CAS award is challengeable in Switzerland, but very rarely will the challenge succeed. And the CAS award is then to be enforced throughout the world as a Swiss arbitral award pursuant to the New York Convention. It is accepted that in extreme circumstances, courts may decline to award arbitral awards. In particular, under Article 5.2 of the New York Convention, recognition and enforcement of an arbitral award may be refused if recognition or enforcement of the award would be contrary to the public policy of that country. But that exception is interpreted narrowly all over the world. Public policy is a very limited notion for these purposes under an assumption that arbitral awards should be respected and treated normally as final, so as to respect the uh, interests which underpin recourse to arbitration, expertise, speed, relative cheapness. So, in a particular sporting context, a US court asked to set aside a suspension against Justin Gatlin, the doped athlete, refused to intervene with the cancer ward. The US court said that public policy is a very slender exception reserved for decisions which violate the most basic notions of morality and justice. They went so far in the Gatlin case as to say that they thought they, the US court thought, the CAS processes had been arbitrary and capricious. But even finding that was not enough to prompt the American court to intervene in a foreign award, a Swiss award, against an American athlete. The CAS award was upheld, the message being to Gatlin that if you wish to challenge the award, go to Switzerland. But as we've seen, don't expect to succeed in Switzerland. Put that together, and there's a rather powerful autonomy asserted for the Lex Sportiva. This contractual process of submission to arbitration leads to CAS awards, which are rarely interfered with and widely respected. But it doesn't work so well as far as European Union law is concerned. European Union law breaks open this contractually achieved autonomy for the arbitral process. For example, because we have a number of sports cases in EU law where third parties are involved who are not bound by this contractual network. Broadcasting cases, for example, are not subject to the CASA's jurisdiction. Broadcasters are beyond the contractual framework. So, for example, the case on satellite decoders, FA Premier League, QC Leisure, and Karen Murphy and Media Protection Services was simply treated as a straightforward EU law case concerning the free movement of services, competition law, and was not excluded 
from the jurisdiction by any notion of contractual protection of sporting autonomy. Even more striking is the Maker Medina and Maishen case. This is the case involving swimmers challenging uh, suspensions as a result of doping violations. Their suspensions had been confirmed, albeit shortened, by a CAS ruling. They then sought to have the Commission intervene in the matter on the basis that European competition law had been violated, and the Commission refused. So the swimmers challenged the Commission under European Union law. But that immediately took the matter outside the contractual network set up by the sports governing bodies. The Commission being no part of that regime. So Maker, Medina and Maishen was heard, dealt with as a straightforward European Union law case with no regard to the claim of sports bodies to achieve autonomy through the arbitral solution. There's no mention at all of the New York Convention in the court's judgments in Maker, Medina and Maishen. Most significant of all in using EU law to crack open arbitral finality is the Echo Suisse decision, which is not a sports case but has significant implications for sports law and specifically for sports arbitration. This was the case in which it was claimed that an arbitral award was based on a licensing agreement which was invalid as being in breach of what we now know as Article 101 TFEU. It was anti-competitive. The Court of Justice in Echo Suisse took the view that as a matter of public policy, it was required that the National Court consider the application of EU competition law, even though the matter had been subjected to an agreed arbitral process. In short, European competition law prevails over contractual finality. And the uh, submission of the matter to arbitration was not sufficient mm. to deter the National Court from being required to apply European competition law in order to set aside any violation thereof. That must also apply, I think, to free movement cases. And so far as an arbitral award fails to comply with EU free movement law, then I think the same logic must apply. There's nothing at all in the court's case law that suggests that EU free movement law stands on a lower level from EU competition law. So the Echo Suisse logic must mean that an arbitral award should be opened up by a national court if there is a violation of competition law or if there is a violation of free movement law. So CAS awards are, in this sense, exposed to scrutiny under European Union law to a much greater extent than they are under national law. And this clearly limits the claim to autonomy which in practice sports bodies are able to make. I remember I said that sports bodies also have the possibility of imposing sanctions on parties that violate their rules. Sanctions on parties that go to the ordinary courts. Well, they can't sanction the European Union. They can't throw the European Union team out of the World Cup. The European Union doesn't have a team. So as a matter of practice, the European Union is in a far stronger position to lever open the autonomy claimed by sports bodies and enforced through contract than is the state. So the contractual approach, the use of arbitration has some virtue as far as sports bodies are concerned. It does give them a degree of autonomy. The Lex Sportiva is to some extent protected from ordinary law. But not fully, and very little as far as European Union law is concerned. And my second solution is the legislative solution where sports bodies seek to induce states to give them legislative protection. Sometimes this works remarkably well. If you look at the London Olympic and Paralympic Games Act of 2006, you will find your breath taken away by the extent to which sports bodies were able to extract concessions to their interests, their commercial interests, from the government of a supposedly powerful sovereign state. 
The way it works with the IOC, the way it works with FIFA, is that contracts are struck with host states in which promised concessions are made, and those are then given legislative form. So the London Olympic and Paralympic Games Act involves substantial protection for the intellectual property rights of the International Olympic Committee. It involves substantial tax breaks, so that the taxation laws that would normally apply to commercial activities on British soil don't apply. Selling tickets through unofficial sources is made a criminal offence. Various forms of advertising which do not comply with IOC demands are also made criminal. So the coercive force of the state is put at the disposal of the commercial interests of sports governing bodies. It's a quite astonishing arrangement. If there's any consolation here, it's that sports bodies are really stupid when it comes to enforcing these rights. You probably remember the South African World Cup and the women in their orange dresses being hauled out of the football stadium for advertising Bavaria beer and being kept in jail overnight. No doubt to the absolute delight of Bavaria beer who couldn't believe the level of global publicity they were getting, while FIFA just looked evil. So sports bodies are really stupid, which goes some way to mitigating the quite extraordinary power they're able to leverage through this legislative route. Doesn't work very well as far as the European Union is concerned, though. Sports governing bodies have always wanted explicit autonomy from European Union law. They've never been politically strong enough to get it. We know that the Amsterdam Declaration was the first time uh, in which sport was recognised in the texts of the, of the EU law. The Amsterdam Declaration famously did not give any degree of sporting autonomy. It's simply reflected in a rather ambiguous way the presumed special status of sport. And it's a similar story for the Nice Declaration as well, where, again, sports bodies were not strong enough to extract a, a promise of autonomy from the political process. And when we get to the Lisbon Treaty, we find sporting bodies following a policy of inclusion, not exclusion. They were not able to secure exemption from European Union law. So instead, the Lisbon Treaty reflects that sport is within the scope of EU competence. The best that sporting bodies could do was to extract wording which they hoped would reflect within European Union law their special concerns. So this legislative solution, this attempt to extract legislative concessions, which as far as the EU is concerned would be treaty-based exceptions, only goes so far. Where big events, World Cup, Olympic Games, are concerned, you can expect sporting bodies to have some success in extracting one-off, time-limited exceptions from the normal application of legal rules. They do get protection for their commercial interests, for their tax interests. But nowhere that I'm aware of grants a general autonomy of infinite duration to sport. Nor should it, given the huge amount of commercial significance attached to sporting practices. So that's the contractual solution, which goes so far in giving sports bodies what they want, autonomy, but only so far. There's a legislative solution, which goes so far in giving sports bodies what they want, autonomy, but only so far. My third strategy is the interpretive or adjudicative solution. This, as far as sports bodies are concerned, is certainly their least favourite strategy. It involves going before ordinary courts and trying to argue that sport is special and that legal rules should be interpreted in such a way as to reflect that special status. Sports bodies find that the least attractive strategy because they are where they don't want to be, before the ordinary courts. But they 
then try and establish a degree of flexibility, a degree of openness in the interpretation of legal rules reflecting sporting interests. This, I think, is the strategic and the intellectual heart of sports law. Strategically, we have to understand how sports bodies frame their arguments to try and persuade judges that sport is special and that legal rules should be molded accordingly. And it's a constant strategic theme in the litigation that sports bodies claim more autonomy than judges are typically willing to give them. It's the intellectual heart of sports law because the job of the academic is to make normative judgments on how convincing the claims of sporting bodies really are. What is special to some extent, not to the extent that sports bodies commonly claim, but we have to make some sort of judgment on just how special sport really is and just how that then should be accommodated in the interpretation and application of ordinary law to sporting practices. This is what has always fascinated me as a sports lawyer. How do we judge just how strong the claims really are about the supposed special status of sport? Any sports lawyer around the world deals in these sorts of inquiries. European Union sports law is just one jurisdiction-specific illustration of the task. So, sometimes we can clearly find that sport is special and that legal rules are applied with respect for that. While Arvon Koch, in Union Cycliste Internationale, are the first of the cases that the Court of Justice ever decided concerning sport, and the question there was whether discrimination on the grounds of nationality should be permitted in team representative sport. You would get nationality discrimination like that in a normal industry, and if you did, you'd quickly rule it in breach of European Union law, which is founded fundamentally on our prohibition against nationality discrimination. But sport's special. We do expect national representative teams to be based on nationality discrimination. That's the very character of international sport. The sport's special. The Court of Justice had some considerable difficulty working out exactly how to fit within European Union law the notion that nationality discrimination is permitted. It's beyond the scope. Is it an exception? Is it a justification? But the basic point was clear enough. This nationality discrimination is permitted in sport, but it wouldn't be elsewhere, because sport's special. Similarly, any and UEFA concerned UEFA's rules prohibiting the ownership of more than one football club. We would find that in a normal industry. If we did, we'd assume that that was a restriction on the competitive structure of the market. It depresses demand. We would only impose such restraints in a normal industry if the acquisition of one firm by another were to lead to an anti-competitive consequence within the meaning of the merger regulation. But sports special. Individuals may own only one football club so as to preserve the uncertainty which is characteristic of professional sport. Were there to be a match between two clubs owned by the same person, then there would be serious doubt about the credibility of the contest. So the rule restricting ownership of clubs is sports specific. It reflects the special nature of sport and it is allowed. They're under an interpretation of EU competition law which was sensitive to the special demands of sport. Sometimes though, sport is not special. Sometimes we have blatant violations of European law which just happen to arise in the sports sector, but where the sports context is not a relevant factor and therefore not a shield to the application of EU law. So when the Italian public authorities violated the public procurement directives in the construction of the Milan football stadium for the 1990 World Cup, 
the court found that that was a breach of European Union law, which was in no way to be excused by the fact that a football stadium was involved. It could have been a school, it could have been a hospital, it could have been a motorway, it could have been any construction project. It just happened to be a football stadium. It was a breach of European Union law. Sport's not special there. In the UK, when Manchester United and several manufacturers and retailers were found to have been fixing prices for the sale of replica football shirts, there was no defence that this was a matter concerning sport. It was price fixing, naked price fixing, which is one of the most serious of all anti-competitive practices. And there was absolutely no reason to weaken the sanction just because it happened to be football shirts that were involved. It could have been sausages, it could have been potatoes. The context didn't matter, the price fixing did. So too, sale of tickets for the 1998 Football World Cup. The French authorities limited the opportunity to buy tickets blind in advance of the draw for the competition to French nationals and French residents. That's a breach of basic EU principles. And there was no reason associated with the fact that this was sale of tickets for a sports event to excuse that violation based on nationality discrimination. The French authorities had abused their dominant position by selling on discriminatory terms. They were in violation of what we now know as Article 102. A small fine was imposed, but more significantly, ever since that time, blind selling of tickets for major sporting events held in the European Union has been conducted without discrimination on the grounds of nationality. The World Cup in Germany. Olympic Games in London involved selling without reference to nationality as far as nationals of EU member states were concerned. It doesn't help you much in South Africa, it doesn't help you much in Brazil, it does help you in the European Union. Final example of a case where sport isn't special is um, Associate Accept, which is a recent decision of the court concerning um, an outburst by an individual associated with Steyr Bucharest. He said, and I've given you the quote, not even if I had to close FC Steyr down would I accept a homosexual on the team. There's no room for gays in my family and FC Steyr is my family. It would be better to play with a junior rather than someone who was gay. No one can force me to work with anyone. I have rights just as they do. And I have the right to work with whomever I choose. The court treated this as a case where the sporting context was irrelevant. The legal questions were about the attribution of responsibility to an employer for statements of an employee. And the court's answers to the questions referred to it focused exclusively on those questions of discrimination law. Sport wasn't special there. This was a straightforward case concerning the scope of discrimination law. It's a case I do bring to mind quickly whenever I hear the uh, governing bodies of sports talking about sport as a force for tolerance and fair play in society. Not in Romania, it would appear. So sometimes sport's special, sometimes it's not. EU law reflects that. The really interesting cases are where sport may be special. And we have to argue about just how special it might be. And I think those cases, the maybe cases, are the ones which are the most high profile of all. Bosman was such a case. Bosman, of course, was the case which first taught us that European Union law and sport were going to come into ever more frequent collision. So nationality discrimination, club football, it concerned the transfer system. The most important part of the court's judgment in Bosman was its acceptance that sport is special. So the court said, in view of the considerable social importance of sporting activities, and in particular football, in the community, the aims of maintaining a balance between clubs by preserving a certain degree of equality 
and uncertainty as to results, and of encouraging the recruitment and training of young players, must be accepted as legitimate. There's nothing in the treaty that says anything like that at the time. There was nothing in the treaty that referred to sport at all. That's the court deciding for itself with no constitutional background what is the special status of sport. What must be accepted as legitimate. It's an immensely creative judgment, but one which, right there, plainly accepts for two reasons that sport is special. The transfer system which was attacked in Bosman was considered to be indefensible, in short, because it was too restrictive particular with regard to restraints placed on players even after the expiry of their contract of employment. But the court seemed open in the Boston <coughs> ruling to the maintenance of a, of a redesigned transfer system. And that, of course, is exactly what happened that a transfer system post Bosman was redesigned. We still have a transfer system, albeit of a more limited nature, in football where you would not find one in the sector for supermarkets or lawyers or bankers or university lecturers. The sport special. The court opened the door to sport being special in Bosman. Not terribly convincingly, in my view. I agree that the aim of maintaining a balance between clubs is a significant sporting concern. You don't worry about balance and in the uh, supermarket sector or the banking sector, you do worry about in the sports sector. I actually don't believe the transfer system is a very good way or a way at all to address those concerns. Much better would be a more aggressive redistribution of wealth from strong clubs to weaker clubs. But at least I can see that the transfer system might have some relevance there. I've never been able to understand why the court thinks that there's something special about sport when it comes to encouraging the recruitment and training of young players. Supermarkets train young employees, banks train young employees, universities train young employees. They don't need a transfer system to encourage them. Why the football clubs? never been able to understand why the court in Bosman thought that sport is so special that it needs extra incentives to train players beyond those that which, we, which we would expect to find in a normal industry. So my view of the Bosman case is that it clearly shows that the Court of Justice agrees that sport is special, but I think the court was too generous to sport in the Bosman ruling. It's not quite as special as all that. Lake and Medina is another case which shows the willingness of the court to load into European Union law sports special concerns. Competition law case concerning doping. Court of Justice in Lake and Medina took the view that EU competition law was capable of applying in principle to sporting practices which restricted the livelihood of an athlete, but it interpreted EU competition law in such a way as to allow sport to make decisions about exactly how to run its anti-doping procedures and also about choosing the appropriate penalties. Nika Medina is a case again which was decided by the court without a treaty background that helped it, but where the court fed in to the interpretation of EU law the special sporting concerns about um, suppressing anti-doping, which is part of the significant identity of the sport, but is also commercially significant to sponsors like Clean Sport. Jamaica Medina, for me, stands as a case where the court creatively accepts that sport is special. The court didn't get any thanks from sporting governing bodies for these decisions. In fact, the court is frequently misrepresented by sporting um, uh, administrators. I've given you just one example there on my handout. It's a uh, quotation from the Financial Times. Olympics chief fears EU grip on doping rules. 
The Olympic movement faces the frightening prospect of anti-doping rules coming under the responsibility of the European Union, unless the Lisbon summit agrees to exempt sport from EU free market rules, the president of the International Olympic Committee has warned. Mr. Roga highlighted the so-called Mika Medina doping case, in which the European Court of Justice ruled last year that anti-doping laws contravened EU competition law by taking away freedom to compete from two banned swimmers. Well, no, it didn't. It did exactly the opposite. <laughs> you see there is the sense of entitlement that sports administrators have. They do not expect to be subjected to the law and they will misrepresent it wickedly so as to promote their political claim to autonomy. As far as lawyers are concerned, though, we must deal with these cases on their own terms, and as we see from Bosman and from Mick and Medina, EU law is open to arguments about the special status of sport. <coughs> the famous case that was never decided of Charlois, the Ulmer case, would have been an intriguing insight in the, into the extent to which the Court of Justice accepts that sport's special. This was a case on player release. FIFA rules which require clubs to release players for international matches. At the time, with no compensation being payable. And the argument in the Shallower case was that the football authorities were abusing their dominant position by forcing clubs to release prize assets to play at international level. And remember that clubs and international sporting bodies such as FIFA are to some extent in a competitive relationship because there is a market for broadcasters, there's a market for sponsors, and Champions League is in competition with the World Cup, the European Championship. So clubs and governing bodies do stand in a relationship of competition for some purposes as a result of the spillover of regulatory functions into the commercial arena, which is characteristic of FIFA's activities. So the background of the shallower case was, was quite amazing. Clubs were being forced to release employees to go and work for a competitor. You would never imagine that in the banking sector or supermarket sector or a sausage making sector. Employee, go and work for your main competitor next week. I don't think so. In football, it's exactly what happened. The Court of Justice never got the chance to decide whether the player release rules were compatible with EU law or not because the case was settled on terms which allowed the stronger clubs, who were behind this litigation, a louder voice in football governance. That was the um, winding up of the G14 group and the establishment of the European um, um, Clubs Association. Had the court had the opportunity to decide the case, it would have had to decide how special sport is. I think that the court would probably have decided that the player release system was compatible with European Union law, because otherwise, there would be no international football. And international football is one defining element of the sport. But I'm pretty sure the Court of Justice would not have held it was lawful to require player release without compensation. And the system here too has been renovated since the collapse of that litigation. And some compensation at least is now paid for player release. The next opportunity the court may have to decide how special sport is will be in connection with the financial fair play rules, where a complaint has been laid before the Commission about their alleged anti-competitive consequences. Financial fair play rules are presented um, as serving a number of different purposes. I think the most convincing is that they are a means to discipline and control spending by clubs. We wouldn't have any such rules in a normal industry. If banks, supermarkets got together and decided to agree on how much they'll spend on wages and other costs, then of course 
they would be immediately found to be in breach of Article 101. It's so not special. How special? The best argument, I think, is that a bank that spends too much goes out of business. A supermarket that spends too much goes out of business. Nobody cares. Football club that spends too much can't just be allowed to go out of business. There is too much cultural baggage associated with major football clubs to allow the normal discipline of bankruptcy to reign within the sector. So the best argument for financial fair play, I think, is that although it seems to be an anti-competitive arrangement, it nevertheless is a reflection of the special characteristics of sport and the need to maintain clubs to which fans as consumers are attached. At the same time, it is anti-competitive in at least two ways. There are horizontal anti-competitive implications of financial fair play associated with the clubs agreeing together to hold down wages. There are also vertical implications in the sense that the rules are enforced by a licensing system which will keep out newcomers who are able to raise money through means other than purely sport. So the financial fair play rules, in short, consolidate the advantage of Manchester City and Paris Saint-Germain, but prevent any other similar club rising through the um, uh, good offices of a Russian oligarch or an Arab oil man. Court of Justice will need to be persuaded that the anti-competitive implications are acceptable, given the um, uh, contribution to uh, discipline, financial discipline in sport, and I think that will be an interesting and difficult case for the court to decide should it ever come that far. I, for my part, think that the anti-competitive anti implications are severe, and I also think that there are ways to deal with the problem of the disappearing big club, which are less restrictive than financial fair play. Corporate entities can go bankrupt, Football clubs don't have to. We do have ways to save football clubs that spend too much without sending them into oblivion, relegate them for a season, take points away. Football has its own mechanisms, which I think can achieve the ends pursued by financial fair play, but in a less anti-competitive way. I may be right, I may be wrong. The main point, however, is that litigation of this type will bring straight to the surface the question of how special sport really is, and the extent to which that should be reflected in the interpretation of orthodox European Union competition law. All this is taken over in the Lisbon Treaty. Article 165, as we know, now grants an explicit, albeit limited, legislative competence to the European Union in the field of sport and it directs that the Union shall contribute to the promotion of European sporting issues while taking account of the specific nature of sport, its structures based on voluntary activity, and its social and educational function. Union action shall be aimed at developing the European dimension in sport by promoting fairness and openness in sporting competitions. I don't think there's anything new there. I think that's more or less a reflection of the way that the court has approached sport through the prism of free movement law and competition law ever since 1974. That's to say, I think the specific nature of sport, now explicitly recognized in the EU's treaties, is something that the court had already used as the heart of its interpretive approach to the subjection of sporting practices to EU law. That seems to be pretty much the attitude of the Court of Justice too in the Olivier Bernard case, where it simply reflected the Lisbon Treaty's innovation as being a corroboration of its pre-existing approach. And the Commission too, as far as I can see, is not treating the Lisbon Treaty as in any sense transformative of the, of the uh, Union's acquis in the field of sport. So the Commission communication of January 2011 very much has an agenda of consistency with the 2007 White Paper, and it doesn't treat intervening Lisbon changes as being anything radical. So, the Lex Sportiva 
is to some extent separated from the ordinary law of states. And to a lesser extent, separated from European Union law. The contractual solution goes some way to granting sporting autonomy, but only some. The legislative solution is available for one-off high-profile events. It goes some way to protecting sporting autonomy, but only some way. As I say, the strategic and the intellectual heart of sports law is my third strategy, the interpretive strategy, where we have to decide how far the special claims of sport should affect the interpretation of orthodox legal rules. European Union law mostly means free movement law and competition law. My view is that the court has done a pretty good job in absorbing the special claims of sport. I don't accept the complaints commonly made by sports bodies that the European Court of Justice misunderstands their special needs. If anything, mentioned in connection with Bosman, the Court of Justice is sometimes too generous to the special claims made by sport. But my concluding remark is that in general, I think the Court has done a pretty good job in accepting that sport is special, but usually not quite as special as sporting bodies would wish. Thank you.